Over two spells as Real Madrid's president, Florentino Perez has become one of the most significant and successful figures in Los Blancos' history. The man behind the Galacticos, to the majority of Real fans, he's a god, a man who's delivered unprecedented glory. But to others, he's the devil, a power-hungry dictator who's money-obsessed. So how can a man be loved and loathed in equal measure? To see why he's so divisive, you need to understand the full story of Florentino Perez. Born in Madrid in 1947, Perez came from a middle-class family. Real was his boyhood club and he grew up a devoted supporter, regularly attending games. But despite his love for Real and football in general, Perez showed an early interest in engineering as he got a degree in civil engineering at the Technical University of Madrid. However, instead of pursuing a career in construction, Perez had a strong appetite for power and influence. This appetite saw him try his hand in politics. In 1979, he joined the Madrid City Council and was later offered a role in the Ministry of Public Works and Transport. Even with this promotion, Perez was wanting more prestige and control. He was elected the General Secretary of the newly founded Democratic Reformers Party, but this didn't last long, as following the 1986 general elections, the party dissolved, as it didn't receive enough votes to earn a representative in Parliament. His career in politics was branded a failure, however these years proved invaluable to Perez. Politics and football, surprisingly, have a lot of similarities, especially if you're Real Madrid's president. Perez turned his attention to business. Along with a group of friends, he purchased a small, bankrupt construction company called Padros, and managed to make it profitable. This is where Perez's career started to lift off. At that time in Spain, the construction industry was booming. Over the next seven years, Perez smartly exploited this, acquiring numerous contracts for his new company. Spain has been described as a country that works via the telephone. Essentially, you can only get as far as your connections go. During this period, society was becoming more technologically advanced and digitally connected by the day. It was easier than ever to build a network of connections. This is where Perez learnt the power of relationships. His connections and wealth were growing daily. Then, in 1993, Padros merged with Ocesa to later form ACS Group, now one of the biggest, if not the biggest, construction companies in the world, a company Perez chairs to this day, the company behind his staggering net worth. Even after this newfound fame and fortune, Perez still wasn't satisfied. He was craving further power, and this craving led to him finally acting on a lifelong ambition. In 1995, Perez entered himself for the presidential position at his boyhood club, Real Madrid. The Real Madrid presidency is a unique role, mainly because of how the club is run. Real is owned by the socios. Socios are club members, and in total, there's just over 90,000 of them. Essentially, they're fans. Crucially, they hold the voting rights for both the presidential and board elections. Due to Real Madrid not having one single owner or consortium, they can't raise funds the same way other clubs can. Real rely on their revenue and their revenue alone. They live off what they make. If managed right, this isn't a problem for them due to their incredibly large annual income, but managed wrong and the situation can go incredibly badly. To summarise, the president of Real Madrid is the most important role at the club by a mile. The president heading into the 1995 election was Ramon Mendoza, but even though Mendoza was facing huge pressure following admission of the club's extensive debts, he still won the election. Perez had faced a huge setback back in his quest for influence and status. But the defeat didn't affect his thirst for power, and in 2000, Perez returned for another go. This time, he was up against the current president, Lorenzo Sanz. Sanz assumed, after recently winning the Champions League in 1998 and 2000, he had enough credit in the bank with the socios. But regardless of the success on the pitch, the picture off it was much bleaker. The club was still in huge financial troubles, and the stadium was a struggle to fill. Like any good politician, Perez used both of these things against Sanz. You can probably now understand why his career politics was so useful. His manifesto was clear. Perez felt Real Madrid's potential wasn't being maximised. He emphasised he could turn around the off-field issues and promised an aggressive transfer policy, which included one-star signing every season. Perez promised Real Madrid the Galacticos, and it would all start with one player. During the summer of 2000, Luis Figo was at the peak of his career. Captaining Real's arch-rivals Barcelona, the Portuguese was becoming an icon at the club. Perez didn't care for any of this, promising that if he failed to sign Figo, he would pay the cost of all the season's tickets for the socios. Perez was confident he could get his man, but how? Remember what I said about how Spain works via the telephone, about how relationships are key? Well, Perez had struck a deal with Figo's agent. He had sought assurances that Figo would consent to the move. Everyone thought Perez was mad for promising this, but he knew he could get it done, and more importantly, he knew Sanz couldn't make the same promise. Real fans and the socios were in disbelief, but they were also going mad with excitement. In their minds, there was no choice. The socios had to vote for Perez. Perez won the election after getting 55% of the vote and met Figo's 50 million euro release clause immediately. Real Madrid had got someone who was going to catapult their club into another galaxy, but it wasn't who they originally thought. 
Finally, Perez had got his hands on the power and prestige he'd been craving throughout his career. But this first spell as president wasn't where his dictatorship of Real began. The next six years would be a roller coaster. All the control he now possessed came with huge responsibility, as well as one huge problem, the club's enormous debt. But he had a plan. To resolve this massive issue, he reverted to drastic measures. He made a decision which is still questioned to this day. It was the sale of the land owned by Real in La Castellana Avenue, land that included the club's training ground. Along with Madrid City Council, where Perez conveniently used to work, the club sold the plot of land for approximately 500 million euros to four corporations. Unnamed clubs requested the EU investigate the transaction as they suspected foul play, and years later, they were proved right. Moral issues were also raised as the sale of the land altered Madrid, deepening the geographical inequalities between the rich north and the working class south. The sale of this land didn't solely impact Rao's finances, it changed the fabric of Spain's capital. Despite his Madrid roots, Perez didn't care. This money cleared all of Real's debt, and along with starting a system that saw image rights shared equally between the player and club, it left Real with a vast amount of money to build a new training complex and enact Perez's infamous policy, the Galacticos. His dream had become reality. On the pitch, the picture was even better. Perez's arrival brought immediate success, as Real won La Liga in 2001 and 3, as well as their ninth Champions League in 2002. Following their 2003 La Liga triumph, Perez added David Beckham to Real's star-studded squad. His world-class footballing ability, mixed with his off-the-field fame, resulted in Perez and Real gaining huge marketing potential across the globe, but especially in Asia. In Perez's eyes, an untapped market. Again showing his never-ending appetite for more, Real started doing pre-season tours across Asia, as well as marketing campaigns pains on the continent. However, the signing of Beckham marked a line in the sand for Perez's first spell as Real's president. Despite Perez, the supporters and pretty much the entire footballing world expecting Real to take their domination to new heights, the club failed to win a single trophy for the next three seasons. Over in Barcelona, it was now their turn to lift the trophies, as they won successive La Ligas in 2005 and 6, as well as the Champions League. Three years into Perez's reign and the cracks had started to appear. How could a team with that many stars fail to shine, after originally shining so bright? Well, the issues for Perez seemed endless. Due to the policy of signing Galacticos, a lot of emphasis was put on the forward positions, with the defence often neglected in the transfer market. The first three years of his reign saw Perez get away with this, but following Makalele's departure for Chelsea in 2003, things started to fall apart. Perez had refused to raise the midfielders relatively low wages. He was always reluctant to pay large wages to defensive players. However, the Frenchman was arguably the best defensive midfielder in the world. He allowed Perez to get away with neglecting the defence due to his ability to win back the ball. Perez's stubborn faith in his Galactico policy that had lifted Real's stars so high left them crashing back down to earth. Vincente Del Bosque had coached Real to two Champions League titles and their 29th La Liga championship. So it came as a huge surprise to everyone when he was sacked by Perez in 2003. But behind the scenes, a divide had formed. Del Bosque and four players versus Perez and his Galactico policy. The players in Del Bosque were all in favour of Makalele's wage rise. Unsurprisingly, following the Spaniard sacking, all the players that supported Del Bosque left the club shortly after. This was the first example of Perez flexing his muscles as Real's president. He didn't want anyone, no matter their importance, questioning the direction he was taking the club. However, regardless of how strong a statement it was, it turned out to be a fateful error. Del Bosque was able to perform the almost impossible task of balancing the egos in a team full of superstars. Originally, it seemed Perez, responsible for crafting this team of elite players, was the key for Real's success. But Del Bosque's departure revealed how important it was to have a manager who acted as the glue. This proved to be a turning point. From then onwards, Perez couldn't stop himself from interfering, leading to over a three-year period, four directors of football and five coaches. This was clearly the sign of a man trying to correct a decision he knew he'd got wrong. During this period, coaches were allegedly forced to play Galacticos, regardless of form, as Perez wanted to maximise marketing potential. The instability Perez had created was crucial for why Real went three seasons without a trophy. Despite the increased revenue, Perez's obsession with marketing caused huge issues for Real on the pitch. Many believe Beckham was only signed for marketing reasons and because of his huge popularity in Asia. The consensus was that looks and ability were alarmingly close in terms of importance for Perez. Reportedly, a close associate of Perez at Real was quoted saying Beckham was signed purely for his good looks, and Ronaldinho, who joined Barcelona the same summer, was too ugly to play for Real Madrid. Ironically, as Real failed to win a trophy for three years, Ronaldinho led Barcelona back to the top of European football, became one of the most marketable footballers in the world, as well as producing an all-time great performance at Real Madrid's Santiago Bernabeu, which saw the home crowd applaud him off. Perez and his associate experienced karma of the highest order. These four key issues led to Perez's downfall in 2000 
2006. However, he left Real in a much better state than when he found it. The large debt had gone, average attendances had doubled, their annual revenue had almost tripled, and they had a new training ground, which was 10 times bigger than their previous one. Perez, by his high standards, had failed, stating Real needed a change of direction, but the club were now set up for success. Success that followed immediately after Perez's resignation. Real won La Liga in 2007 for the first time in four years, and then won the league again the following season. However, whilst the first two years since Perez's departure had been successful, the 2008-09 season ended up being one of the most disastrous in the club's history. Real lost in the round of 16 of the Champions League for the fifth season in a row, 5-0 to Liverpool over two legs, and they were also humiliated by Barcelona, 6-2 at the Bernabeu, as the Catalan club went on to win the treble. This led to outrage among the Real Madrid fans. Despite the awful end to his presidency, they called for Perez to save them again. Meanwhile, during this three-year period, Perez was busy himself. He'd been focusing on finding a strategy for ACS as a result of the global financial meltdown. Sadly, his wife, Maria Angeles Sandoval, also known as Patina, was seriously ill. She'd been diagnosed with lung cancer. The couple met when Perez was 24 at a cafe in Madrid. And just like her husband, she was an avid supporter of Real. She never missed a match, always seen sat behind her husband at games. The pair were incredibly close and she was a mainstay in Perez's life. This left Perez splitting his time between leading ACS for a financial crisis and looking after his ill wife. But despite all of this, Perez kept a close eye on Real. He could sense another chance as president was on the cards. And following the awful 2008-09 season, Perez saw his opening. Ramon Calderon, who succeeded Perez as president, resigned in January 2009 following corruption allegations. Given Perez was the only candidate able to provide the 57 million euro guarantee, Perez returned for a second spell as Real's president. This second spell was to be Perez's defining reign. He'd split opinion before, but this stint as Real's ruler was where he became a god to some and the devil to others. The club was in debt again, with the figure approximately as high as 500 million euros, but he managed to secure a deal with a Catalan bank. The Galactico policy that had come back to bite him was continued with immediately. Perez signed Caco and Cristiano Ronaldo in the space of three days for a combined £140 million. With a few other additions, it was clear Perez's dictatorship had begun. Despite the first season resulting in zero trophies, over the next 14 years, Real Madrid would win 25 trophies under Perez's stewardship. That's just under two a season. This included La Decima in 2014, where Real Madrid made history and won their 10th Champions League, as well as three consecutive Champions Leagues between 2016 and 2018. All of this is compounded to make Perez a god in Madrid. In the majority of the supporters' eyes, all this success has been down to him. On the face of it, this decade and a half might have seemed like plain sailing. However, during these years, Perez has faced some major dilemmas and moments. In 2012, his wife Patina died following a heart attack. Despite her lung cancer, her death came as a sudden shock as she was in remission. Her passing came just 21 days after Real won their third league title under Perez. Described by Ola.com, Patina was a true Madridster, that shoulder to cry on for Florentino during Real Madrid's defeats, and that advisor who helped him make the toughest decisions. Unsurprisingly, this was a massive loss for Perez and his family. In a life full of chaos, she was a constant presence. Perez would now have to face the rest of his present presidency and indeed his life without his rock. In a move that would anger some of the most faithful and passionate Real fans, Perez banned the ultra sir Real's Ultras from the Bernabeu in 2013. Members of the group had exhibited violent, racist and homophobic behaviour. Perez announced the reorganisation of the Bernabeu South Stand as he looked to create a new, young group of supporters who would be more accepting and tolerant. He wanted more positivity. To enforce this, he asked every fan in that section of the stadium to sign an agreement with the club, which required them to support the team relentlessly and stand for the entire 90 minutes. It's our argued that Perez's nice guy act was nothing but a smokescreen. The ultra sir opposed his dictatorial management of the club and disagreed with many of his decisions regarding the team, often booing him at matches. Perez felt threatened by them. Whether this felt dictatorial or not, the majority of Real fans and Spanish football in general supported his decision, as he had rid the stadium of violence, racism and homophobia. Perez has later revealed that the ultra sirs have graffitied his house and even his wife's gravestone. He's been at war with the ultras throughout his presidency, and most of the negativity Perez has faced stems from the ultra sir. Also in 2013, Perez tightened his control of the Real Madrid presidency. Following his re-election that year, Perez introduced new rules for how to become president. Now, any candidate had to have been a socio for 20 years, up from 10. And he also changed the regulations so that candidates had to have 15% of the club's projected outgoings guaranteed by a Spanish bank and themselves, with no third party help. Unsurprisingly, due to his wealth, such requirements were no problem for Perez. And since the rules inception, no one has been able to stand against him. He's essentially made the socio 
NCOs are relevant, as they now have no choice of who to vote for. It's just Perez. Despite the facade of democracy, this is where Perez's presidency truly became a dictatorship. His long second stint as Rao's dictator is also largely down to his reliance on his huge network of relationships and contacts, with none more important than how close he keeps the Spanish media. Journalists are often in awe when invited to his box. He reportedly doesn't shy away from leaking sensitive information to keep them on side. In return, censoring any negative news, making sure reports flatter Real. Perez runs a propaganda machine. Cristiano Ronaldo, Real's by most accounts greatest ever player in their glittered history, shocked world football when he left the Juventus in 2018. Ronaldo was at the top of his game, scoring 44 goals the previous season and was the Ballon d'Or holder. He'd opened the door for a move following their Champions League title win that year, something which Perez wasn't happy about, saying he hears the same every summer and then nothing happens. Their relationship was a complex one. Initially, Perez didn't even want to sign Ronaldo back in 2009. The deal for the Portuguese had been agreed before Perez's return, and he had to be convinced by then general manager Jorge Valdano to continue with the deal. Following his move to Juve, Ronaldo admitted that he felt Perez no longer considered him the same way that he had done during his first seasons at Real. Perez, rightly or wrongly, had made Real's greatest ever player feel replaceable, dispensable, and worthless. This transfer marked the end of the Galactico era. Instead of Perez focusing on the here and now, it felt like his priority had switched the future. The club started investing in young, promising and exciting players, who could eventually turn into Galacticos one day. The signing of Eden Hazard when he was at his peak was the one exception, and that failure of the transfer highlighted to Perez that this new policy was the one to follow. Since the new approach, the club has won eight trophies in five years, and considering most of the players haven't peaked and won't do for some time, Los Blancos' future is bright. His focus on the future of Real also prompted his plans to renovate the Bernabeu, as in 2019 he promised to build the best stadium in the world. The Real fan base was actually divided on whether this was necessary. Many felt the stadium was already the best in the world, and there were concerns about the debt the club would acquire. In true Florentino Perez fashion, he ignored the noise and continued with what he felt was best. And skip ahead four years, following its completion, his promise to build the world's best stadium has been delivered on, even though some might feel it's still not necessary. All of the controversy and significant moments I've mentioned pale into insignificance when compared to what happened on the 18th of April 2021. This one day would define Florentino Perez's reign as Real's ruler, and indeed his life. In one of football's most historic days, 12 of Europe's elite clubs announced their intention to set up the European Super League. Perez was named as the chairman, and the league was branded as his brainchild. To a select few people who'd followed Perez's career, seen his scheming imagination, as well as his work in the bright lights and in the shadows, this didn't come as a surprise. In fact, in 2009, just after his second reign began, he said we must agree a new European Super League that guarantees the best always play the best. The Super League was something he'd always dreamed about, and in 2021, following the pandemic, which hurt every club financially, the time felt right to push forward with it. European clubs had become increasingly jealous of the ludicrous revenue the Premier League was generating. If we try and jump inside his mind, you can somewhat understand this bitterness. Perez has had to take huge decisions that's divided his fan base, as well as huge risks on transfers. He's also had to deal with the fact Real are member owned. They don't have unlimited resources, unlike others. His jealousy is toxic, but understandable. Perez used this common ground to create a league that threatens the Premier League's revenue. For all clubs, even Premier League clubs, Perez's project was too good to miss out on. In theory, it was bulletproof, but in practice, it was ripped to shreds. What followed the announcement of the league was arguably the greatest showing of unity football has ever seen. Perez had united everyone, but against him. Fans from all clubs, Clubs from all over Europe lined the streets and took to social media to let Perez and all 12 clubs know this wasn't going to happen. One by one, the clubs that initially agreed to join the Super League pulled out. Perez had created a party for the elite, but he didn't expect everyone to gay crush it. As I've shown with his life, he never seems to know when he's lost. There was no admittance that this had been a mistake, not a hint of sorriness. He even went on Spanish national TV and defended the league on the same day it had collapsed, arguing that football has to evolve, that football is losing interest, and the Super League would save football. Remarkably, his actions weirdly make me feel an element of respect towards him. Despite every possible fan, player, journalist, and even politician telling him that this will never happen, that this is an awful idea, he still has unwavering belief in it. The Super League highlights Perez's 
his dark and evil side, but it also perfectly summarises how he's achieved so much in his life and reached such power and status. A complete belief in himself and his ideas, as well as a constant appetite for more influence and wealth. The Super League is Florentino Perez's defining act, but it also defines who he is. Regardless, at Real, his power is now absolute, but because his decisions always has the club and its fan base at the centre, most of their supporters wouldn't want anyone else leading their club. I think no matter what side of the fence you sit, you can't help but be fascinated by Perez. To the majority of Real Madrid fans, he's a god, a man who's made some of the most expensive transfers profitable, delivered an unprecedented amount of success, as well as setting the club up for the future, both on the pitch and off it. To others, he's the devil, a man who holds a vast amount of power and control, not only in Spain, but across the footballing world, that threatens to destroy the game as we know it. Europe stood up to him, showed him that the power of football is not held in meeting rooms and directors' boxes, but on the concourses. Florentino Perez has built a footballing heaven for Real Madrid, even though many believe he belongs in hell.